This is a lecture on cell senescence and apoptosis from September 30th, 2020. And in the first part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the molecular mechanisms of intrinsic and extrinsic pathways of apoptosis or programmed cell death. And so you've likely heard of apoptosis before in another class. Um, and as I said, it's a programmed form of cell death used to get rid of dead or damaged cells, as well as to kind of reverse an immune response after cells, um, B cells are made in response to a pathogenic invader. And so during development, apoptosis is usually required for organ tissue and shaping. Um, in particular, I usually think about the cells that normally will exist between you have the fingers um, and toes of an organism. Those webs um, exist in embryonic development. And then apoptosis is what's responsible for um, the death of the cells making up these webs so that we have separated digits um, on our hands and feet. And during development, there has to be sort of this balance between cell death and cell division because cell division is what actually allows organisms to grow and develop. But there are going to be some cells, like those webbed, uh, those cells in the webs between fingers and toes, that no longer have a use. Um, and so there has to be sort of this balance between making more cells and getting rid of the cells that you don't need in order to develop into a functional organism. Um, but then, once we think about aging and maturity and senescence, apoptosis's function is really more shifting towards um, removing damaged cells. Um, because we don't want to continue dividing um, and um, propagating any damage within cells, and so we want to remove them from a grown organism, um, as well as prevent formation of potential disease. Uh, damaged cells can not only divide to create more damaged cells, but they can actually um, infect other cells around them by secreting um, cytokines, for example. And so we want to remove these damaged cells from an organism in order to extend that period of maturity um, and keep physiological function for as long as possible. So apoptosis can be done or activated in two different ways. Um, it can be done through the extrinsic or kind of extracellular signaled pathway or through the intrinsic or intracellular signaled pathway. I'm going to go into the molecular details of both of them in the next couple slides. But what's important to note is that both uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic apoptotic pathways require a particular type of enzyme or protease um, known as a caspase. And what caspases are are cysteine aspartic proteases. So the C comes from cysteine, that ASP comes from aspartic, and the ACE means it's an enzyme. So caspases are um, basically proteases or uh, protein degrading enzymes that chew apart cysteine and aspartic acid residues. And most of the time, caspases will exist in a cell waiting around for a cell death signal. They're not made in response to the cell death signal, but rather they're activated from an inactive pro-caspase form, which you can see here, to an active caspase form. And this happens through cleavage of what's known as the prodomains, which you can see here. So two inactive procaspases will have their prodomains cleaved. They can then dimerize into an active caspase, which can then degrade proteins. And there's actually, um, in a cell responding to an apoptotic signal, there's a uh, cascade of kinase activation, starting with one activated initiator caspase that basically leads to a downstream um, cleavage of more inactive procaspases, which then become activated and can degrade proteins. And so this works in the same way that sort of a signaling or phosphorylation cascade works, where one molecule or one initiator um, transduces that signal, in this case the signal for cell death, um, by activating a bunch of downstream signaling molecules. And some of the proteins that are cleaved by caspases, just as an example, 
are laminin, which it makes up the nuclear lamina, as well as cytoskeletal proteins, and uh, cell cycle regulators, like the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, P21. Right, and so you'll see caspases here in the second half of the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. But in order to activate those procaspases and cleave them into active caspases, there has to kind of be a signal for the cell to die, right, or an apoptotic signal. And in the case of extrinsic pathway of apoptosis, that signal comes from outside of the cell or is extracellular. And so in this case, you can see that a killer lymphocyte, which is an immune cell, will express a ligand, which is the purple molecule here, called fast ligand. And that molecule can bind to fast receptors, which are these red-orange transmembrane receptors here, that are kind of more commonly known um, as death receptors. So you have death receptors in the cell membrane of the cell that's going to undergo apoptosis and a fast ligand that will bind to them on the outside. And that binding of ligand to receptor will activate initiation or formation of this DISC complex, death-inducing silencing complex, right? And so it consists of an adapter protein um, as well as some initiator caspases or those first pro-caspases that will start the uh, caspase cascade. And so altogether, this would be considered the disc complex. And once the initiator caspases have been activated, that signal is now intracellular, and executioner caspases can be cleaved and activated, and ultimately um, degrade proteins and lead to apoptosis. <coughs> So this is what happens when the signal to come to die comes from the outside of the cell. But that signal can also be activated intracellularly through a family of proteins known as the BCL2 proteins. You can see some common both anti-apoptotic and pro-apoptotic BCL2 family members, uh, their domains listed down here. And so in a normal cell, that is not undergoing apoptosis. BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein, is active. And what it does is it basically prevents the formation of channels in the mitochondria that would allow a particular molecule called cytochrome C to be released from the inner mitochondrial membrane. However, when an apoptotic stimulus is uh, received from inside the cell, potentially maybe DNA damage that's beyond repair, it will activate BH3-only proteins to become active, and they will inhibit BCL2, and in doing so, stop its inhibition on the formation of channels in the mitochondria. And now those effector proteins that uh, BCL2 was inhibiting can become active. They come together, they form a channel, and they allow the release of cytochrome C from the inner mitochondrial membrane out into the cytosol. The cytochrome C should not be in the cytosol <clears throat> because when it is, it binds to um, APAF1 and forms a structure called the apoptosome, which ultimately recruits initiator caspases and starts that caspase cascade to lead to apoptosis. Right, and so once again, normally in a cell you'll have anti-apoptotic proteins active, um, but once cells re um, receive an apoptotic stimulus from inside, like DNA damage, BH3 only proteins will be activated and they'll inhibit the anti-apoptotic proteins and promote apoptosis by releasing, by allowing the release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm, where it can then bind to APAF1, form the apoptosome, and recruit initiator caspases to trigger um, the caspase cascade and ultimately apoptosis.